It was 49 years ago next week that some of us here remember gathering around our televisions. Grainy images were flickering as we watched intently and were amazed by what we saw. We heard in a kind of distorted voice words that said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What was so amazing was the first moon landing. I think things have changed a little bit since then. I think it takes a little bit more than that to make us amazed these days. A moon landing? Ancient history. Watching a 19-inch black and white TV with rabbit ear antennas? <laughs> that doesn't sound very amazing to me. We expect a crystal clear HD, if not 4K, image beamed to us on our 72-inch flat screen TV listening on surround sound speakers. It takes a lot to amaze us anymore. If it takes a lot to amaze us, imagine what it must take to amaze our Lord. I mean, after all, He is the creator of all things. He knows all things. He possesses all things. He can do all things. What would it take to amaze Jesus? Now, St. Mark tells us one thing that amazed him in our gospel this morning. It wasn't technology or a new discovery or even a moon landing. What amazed Jesus was people's unbelief. Unbelief is amazing. Jesus was back in his hometown of Nazareth. Of course, he was born in Bethlehem. We all know that. But Nazareth was the city from which Mary and Joseph had come from. And so, therefore, after Jesus' birth a while later, they settled back there in Nazareth. Joseph ran a carpenter shop. Mary and Joseph went on to have more children, half-brothers and sisters of Jesus. Jesus himself apparently learned the trade of carpentry. Something else, though, that Jesus did there in Nazareth. He went to church. He went to the synagogue. We know that from Luke's gospel that that was a, a pattern that Mary and Joseph had set for their family, including Jesus, from early on. Luke's account of our incident in the gospel this morning tells us that Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom. That's something Jesus did every Sabbath day. Let's not pass by that, that, that little point before we move on. Let, let, let's pause just a moment and think about what that means for us. Jesus went to church faithfully, regularly. That ought to give us an awful lot of comfort. And here's why. Jesus didn't just come down to this world to die for us. He came here to live for us to live up to the requirements of God's law that we can't or won't do. So for every single time that you or I have skipped church on a Sunday morning or come to church with a less than cheerful attitude or pass by opportunities that we have had to study his word, Jesus did. He did it faithfully. And he did it for us. We, through faith in him, are credited with that perfect church attendance, with that attention to God's Word. Find comfort in that. Don't, don't use that as an excuse for not being faithful in worship. Use that instead as incentive and as a role model for even more faithful worship and being regularly into the Word of God. So, like he did every other Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue. The synagogue he had grown up in, the synagogue he had spent so many Sabbath days in as a boy and a teenager. But this time it was a little different. This time he was, I guess we would call him the guest preacher. He stood up and he taught the people. He had been asked, apparently, by the head, the ruler of the synagogue to do so. Not unusual. That was the common practice in synagogues, that if there was a visiting rabbi, he would be asked to, to, to read the scripture lesson and to deliver a commentary, a sermon on that. 
And by that point in Jesus' ministry on earth, he had become pretty popular. He was a well-known teacher, a rabbi. So I imagine the synagogue was jam-packed that Sabbath day. Everybody wanted to hear the hometown boy preach. So how did they respond when they heard him preach? Well, we heard in our gospel this morning, St. Mark tells us that some of them were amazed. They are amazed by what they saw and heard in Jesus. No surprise, right? I mean, how could you not be amazed? Can you imagine going to church and having Jesus himself standing in front of you preaching and teaching you God's word? How could that not be amazing? Except that's not what they found amazing. They weren't amazed at Jesus' grasp of Scripture and his ability to proclaim it clearly and memorably. That's not what amazed them. Instead, St. Mark tells us what was amazing to them. He said, the people were amazed. They said, where did this man get these things? What's this wisdom that has been given him that even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They were amazed not at the fact that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. They were amazed at the fact that he claimed to be the Messiah and they flat out rejected it. Again, going back to St. Luke's account of this very same incident, we're told what it was that Jesus was preaching on. The scripture reading that Sabbath day was taken from the book of Isaiah. It was one of those messianic prophecies, one of those prophecies that pointed ahead to the coming Savior. And Jesus, after reading that, stood up and said to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he said, I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. I am the Messiah. I'm the promised Savior, the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And the people said, no way. We know you too well. Amazing. Amazing that they had right in front of them the Son of God. They even talked about his wisdom and noted the miracles he had performed, things that backed up what he claimed to be. And yet they flat out rejected him in unbelief. Even Jesus was amazed by that unbelief. Unbelief is amazing. Still is today. It's amazing that people today can can look around at this, this complex, amazing, beautiful world that God has created to to see all of the intricacies of creation and the way it works together and how how amazingly designed it was, and yet they can say, well, just a a product of random chance. Nobody planned it. Nobody made it. Seriously? That's amazing. It's amazing that that people can can call the Bible basically a, a collection of myths and fairy tales and fables that aren't true and have nothing to do with us today despite the overwhelming evidence that supports the truthfulness of God's Word and how carefully it has been preserved throughout the centuries. It is amazing that people can reject what that Word of God says, that it says you have a God who loves you, a God who loves you so much He gave up His Son for you, a God who forgives you and wants you to live with Him forever, and yet they say, nope, no thank you. What I got here in this world is all I need There's nothing left, nothing more beyond this. Amazing. Unbelief is amazing. But it's not surprising, sadly. In fact, unbelief is the default mode for every human being who's been born into this world. We aren't born believers. We're not even born neutral to God and His Word. We're born His enemies, rejecting the Word of God by birth and by nature. That's true of everyone. So it shouldn't surprise us that many continue in that path of unbelief. We should expect it. And we should expect that 
when we're the ones who are sharing that word with others, when, when we live up to our faith, when we stand up for the values and the morals that God in His law establishes for us, that we get opposition too, just like Jesus, that people reje will reject us or call us ignorant for believing the Bible or call us intolerant for following its teachings. Not surprising, but amazing. It's not surprising because that's where we were too. In fact, it shouldn't be surprising when in our own lives we encounter that, re that urge to reject what God says in His Word. When, when we start doubting things that God tells us in His Word. When, when we don't like what He says because maybe He is condemning something that we like to do. Or when God tells us your sins are gone, they're forgiven, and yet we have that nagging doubts in our mind that no, God's still going to get us for something. That's unbelief. It's amazing. It's not surprising. But most of all, it's sad. Unbelief. That unbelief that was on display there in the synagogue in Nazareth was nothing short of amazing. But there was something else on display there in Nazareth that was even more amazing than unbelief. Did you catch it when you heard the words of the gospel? Look again at the end of our gospel reading. Right after St. Mark says that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, he immediately says, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Think about that for a moment. Jesus had just been rejected by his own townspeople, but the people he knew and had known for years, they rejected him in unbelief. Not only did they just reject him, but again, going back to Luke's account of this incident, we're told that they drove him out of town to the brow of a cliff and wanted to throw him down and kill him. They didn't just say, we don't believe you, Jesus. They said, we want you dead, Jesus. What would you do? If that's what you were met with when you tried to tell people about Jesus and your Savior. People not only didn't believe you, they wanted to kill you for doing it. Pretty sure I know what I'd do. I'd probably retreat, lick my wounds, and just say, forget it. I'm done with this stuff. But that's not what Jesus did. When they rejected him in unbelief, when they tried to kill him in their unbelief, in that amazing unbelief, Jesus continued to reach out. He went from village to another village and to another village and to another village after that. And he continued to hold out the gospel message that there is indeed forgiveness and salvation through faith in him, the Messiah. What's more amazing than unbelief? The compassion of Christ. That's what's more amazing. That compassion wasn't just for the, the people of Judea 2,000 years ago. Today, Jesus still reaches out in compassion. He reached out to you and me, even though we too were born rejecting him in unbelief, but he reached out to us and through the waters of holy baptism, he made us his children. And through the message of God's word, he continues to keep us in the faith. So great is his compassion despite our continued resistance and opposition to it. And he continues to reach out to the world. And he continues to do it through us. Because Christ's compassion for the world is so amazing, we are compelled to continue to hold out that truth of that word to others, despite the fact that we can expect some to reject it. So great is his compassion, so amazing is his compassion that we are compelled to share it with others. With, with that, that friend of yours who, who keeps ribbing you because of what you believe and do or don't do. Or, or that, that relative who, who, who makes it clear to you that they don't believe what you believe and doesn't want to hear anything about it. Or 
that person on the other side of the world that you will never see, at least this side of eternity, we continue to pray for those missionaries who share God's word and support them with our offerings because Christ's compassion is so amazing. Keep sharing God's word. Keep proclaiming its truth. Keep living up to what he tells you in his word. And you can expect that maybe some will believe through the power of God's word. But you can also expect that you're going to face exactly what Jesus faced. There will be those who don't believe, who reject it, who will reject you. We're going to be amazed at the stubborn opposition and unbelief that we encounter But may we never cease to be amazed at the even more amazing, the even greater compassion of Christ. Now that's amazing. Amen.